Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Happy Lord's Day. Today we continue our study in the book of Romans, exploring faith and grace from chapters 4 and 5. But first, let's pray together. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for grace. I thank you for faith. And Lord, I thank you for the price you paid. Speak to us through your word today, Lord. Make it clear to us and help us understand the meaning of Scripture, Lord, and the meaning that, and we just, I just ask for a special word for each person and ask, Lord, for a special anointing. And Lord, may you be glorified in all things. Now, I lift up those prayer requests that are on people's hearts, those that have lost loved ones and many still grieving, Lord, and carrying a heavy burden, those that are sick, those that have, that know people in the hospital or are having surgeries or recovering, that you'd be with them and those who have lost loved ones and family members that are heavy on their hearts, that they might come to know you. Speak to the individuals, Lord, today. And those that just have a heavy burden, they don't even know uh, how to pray it, Lord. I ask you to minister to them. Speak to us through your word. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Romans chapter 4. The story of continued justification by faith through the message of Abraham. Chapter 4 of Romans. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So Abraham could not boast about works because you can't impress a holy God, someone who's perfect. And so it says he wasn't justified by works. But then it says this, but what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. In other words, it wasn't that he did things for God. It was because he believed God and he knew God. And just like the New Testament, in the Old Testament, they were saved by faith, just like the New Testament. Yes, they didn't know about Jesus' death and resurrection yet but they had enough to believe in who God was and what he had revealed to them. But they were still justified by faith, just like the New Testament. So Abraham was justified not for what he did, but because he believed God and that affected what he did. And then it goes on and it says, Now to him who, who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So if, if you feel like you've got to do something to earn your salvation or you have to attend church or you have to give or you have to do so many charitable deeds or more good than bad and so forth, then you're, you're, it's like you're try, you have an obligation, like you, you're paying a debt that you can't pay. <laughs> you can't pay God for salvation. Salvation is from God. It's a free gift. And so it's not of works. But it's, it's what God has given us. He's the one that initiates salvation. It's all a work of God. He paid for it. It's a gift. You can't earn it. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that because we wouldn't know how much we need to pay to own it. We can't pay that much. So it's from the work of what God did. And then moving on to verse 5. But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted to him for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of a man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. And then we have a, a quotation here from, from Psalm. And I love this verse. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And this is such a beautiful picture because it says even David realized, blessed is the man who realizes, praise God, that he, he, he loves the sinner and that he died even for the ungodly because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it says you're blessed. Blessed is, is like having joy, but it's, it's with God's blessing on you. And that's what you want. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. To be forgiven is such a beautiful thing. No one can forgive sin but God. Only he can do that work. But you're blessed when he has forgiven you. And that is true. <laughs> and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man who, to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. 
to impute sin is, is like he doesn't hold it against you. He counts you as righteous, not based on what you did, but based on what someone else did. That's being imputed, accounted righteous for the acts of another or the actions of another, not your own actions. And that's what Jesus did for us. He paid the debt for sin so that God would count it as righteousness toward us because of the actions of Jesus by paying for our sin debt and forgiving us. Verse 9, does this blessedness then come upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. In other words, does it just come to those who act in faith to, to be circumcised or follow the Jewish law and so forth? How then was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. In other words, then it says, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness, of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all who believed, though they are uncircumcised. So basically it says Abraham didn't believe because of the actions that he did. He believed first and then he performed the actions. <laughs> In other words, the things you do are based on your belief. And so he followed God as an act of obedience and circumcision and following the law, but he believed first before any of that happened. You know, it's kind of like baptism. You don't get baptized to get saved. You get saved and then you follow through with baptism as an act of obedience to God. And, and it's a symbol of what has already taken place in your heart, buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. In other words, it's a symbol of what has taken place in your life. That, that your sins are forgiven and now you're a new person. You're raised as a new person. And so, <laughs> sir, praise God that we, we are forgiven. We come just as we are. Faith is the first action to be righteous with God. Not an action we do, but believing God. And then actions will follow because of our belief. And so then it goes on and it says, that he might be the father of all who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. In other words, they might be saved also. And so it says he's the father of all. You remember when, when, when God told him, look at the stars, your descendants will be as the stars in the heaven. They'll be numerous throughout generations. And of course, Abraham, I'm sure, thought, well, gee, I, I physically only had Ishmael and Isaac you know, up to that point. But, but God was talking about children of faith, children who believe. Those are his descendants, people who believe God and it's accounted to them for righteousness. So they might be forgiven also. Praise God that we can't earn salvation and that it's a free gift because we're, none of us are righteous. And the father of circumcision to those who are not only are the circumcised, but also walk in the steps of faith, which are... Father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. In other words, he wasn't heir to the world, you know, because of his, his following the law, but because he believed God uh, through the heir of righteousness, because of the seed. Um, for if those who are of the law are heirs, Faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. So it's saying if you could be saved from the law or from an action you did or by going to church and things like that, then why would you need faith? It means the promise is void. In other words, if, if it's based on something you could do to earn heaven, then, then there's no reason for Jesus to die. But because we need our sins forgiven and it's not based on things we do, but based on what he did and our sins being forgiven. He paid our debt and that was a heavy price to pay. That's the only reason we can be forgiven. And so it's, but so <laughs> praise God he died for our sins and gave his life for us. Because the law brings about wrath for where there is no law, there is no transgression. If the law told you, here's the line, don't cross it. Then if there's no line, you don't know that you've committed any sins. 
but because there is a law, we're aware of our sin and it points out our sin. Therefore, it is of faith that you, it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who was the father of all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who believed, who believed God. So it's according to grace. And I want to look at this word grace because the Bible says, it, it talks about it's according to grace. Well, the Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone could, could boast and say, I did more works than you. But it's not based on that. It's based, it's by grace. And so I think we need to understand what grace is. But to understand grace, you also need to understand mercy. <laughs> and so mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. In other words, that's withholding judgment, which we deserve to die because of our sin. And, and when we don't know God, and so he doesn't impute judgment on us. He doesn't put judgment on us. That's mercy when we deserve judgment. But grace is different. That's God giving us what we do not deserve. And that's like the free gift of salvation. That's grace. It is grace. In other words, it's by faith you believe, but it's the gift of God that makes that happen. It's a grace of God. The world can't give you grace. Only God can. But grace is just the, the, the gift that God gives you by giving you what you don't deserve, which is eternal life and salvation and not giving you judgment, which is mercy. So that's a beautiful understanding the way I understand grace and mercy. So we're saved by grace and by mercy. And then it goes on and it says, in the presence of whom we be he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. <laughs> this is an amazing thing. So it says here, Abraham believed God because he's able to bring the dead back to life. In fact, when he, when he offered Isaac, he believed God would raise him from the dead if he told him to do it, and there was a reason he told him to do it. And so he trusted God. He believed God was faithful. He, he brings the dead back to life, and he creates all things out of nothing. You know, God can take nothing and make something out of it. He can take a dead person and give them life. That's an incredible gift. He can forgive sin and all of a sudden you're righteous and you're forgiven before God. <laughs> That's an amazing thing. God can create anything out of nothing. And that's an amazing thing. And he can raise the dead back to life. Well, that's good enough for me. <laughs> and that's an amazing gift that he does. But because of that, this next verse, it says, who contrary to hope, and hope believed so that he became the father of many nations according to which was spoken. So shall your descendants be. So against all the odds, when it looked hopeless, Abraham still believed God. And the promise that he was expecting God to fulfill it. He knew God could fulfill it. He didn't know how it could happen. He didn't understand it. And, and, like Mary, when she was told as a virgin, she would give birth. She didn't necessarily understand how that was going to work, how she could have a child not knowing a man. But at the same time, she believed that God would be able to perform it. And she was looking at God for her hope that he would be able to pull through, not her. Says, And she said, be it unto me according to your word, based on my belief. I believe you can do that, that God can do. He can make make something out of nothing. He can bring the dead back to life, which he did. And that's an amazing thing. So Abraham, even when it was hopeless, when he didn't have a child in his old age and Sarah was way past childbearing years, he believed God could perform what he said he would do. That is belief. That is, that is believing God and, and knowing we have hope and the same reason we have hope. We have hope knowing of who a God is that we serve, that he will bring those to heaven who believe. <laughs> That's hope. We do have hope. Even when the worst situations are, are out there, it's never hopeless because you always have God. Praise God that we have a Savior. 
And then it says, so shall your descendants be. And, and it says, um, he might become the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. The father of faith, the father of belief. And, and that's how we're all but a descendants of Abraham. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb, she was 90 at the time, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Because he believed God would do it, even though it seemed hopeless, and even though it's like making something happen out of nothing. He believed in hope, and he believed God's word, just like Mary did, that she would have a child as a virgin. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, and he was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Wow. God is, is able to raise the dead. And, and believe me, when I die, I'm so glad I trusted in the one who conquered the grave and who, who rose from the grave himself first. But it says he believed in God and he raised him up from the dead and that Jesus was delivered up for our offenses. That's how he paid the price. He paid for our sin with his death on the cross. That's how, how, how our payment's made so he can forgive us. And he, he lived the perfect life. His blood was a perfect sacrifice, so it's acceptable to God. So God counted as righteousness, and he gave us that righteousness for believing in Jesus to, and accepting his death for us and asking him to forgive our sins. That's why we're counted as righteous, because we believe in that. So he was delivered up for our, um, because of our offenses, but he was raised for our justification. In other words, we're justified in our faith because he raised from the dead. And so that's proof to us, you know, that, that what he did will pay for your debt and you're justified because he raised from the dead. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen and believing that God raised him from the dead. I mean, you're justified because there's a lot of substance to our faith. Chapter five. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of God. We have access. You know, I was talking to our class about this and I said, you know what that access means? In work, you know, unless you're the CEO of a company, you're only granted certain access, whether it's software or, or something you're working on the computer and, and you can't go to certain meetings because you don't have access, you don't have authority. But to think that we have access to the highest above all. I mean, Jesus is so far above presidents and kings and he's the king of kings and lord of lords. I mean, he transcends above every CEO, everybody. It is so far above uh, anyone else, <laughs> there is no comparison. And yet, we may not have access in this life or authority to do certain things or be in that position, but you have access to the one who is the highest. I mean, you, you realize what we have in access? We have peace with God now because Jesus brought man to God and God to man because of his death. And he joined us to God and in righteousness because of what he did. And now we have peace with God. We're right with God. But it, look, eternity is a long time. You know, don't take a chance on your eternity without getting right with God. Have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. But we also have access <laughs> to the grace for which we stand. The Bible says we now can come boldly to the throne of grace and ask for grace and mercy and help in time of need. I mean, you have access to his grace, to his mercy. You can go to the throne of God at any time and you can talk to the one who is above all. 
<laughs> I mean, you can't be in better hands. That's an amazing thing. Uh, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God because we have access. The veil was torn. And you can go directly into the presence of God now <laughs> because of what Jesus did and the debt that was paid on the mercy seat. And he had mercy. <laughs> wow. And not only that, in other words, there's more. <laughs> and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. First, he mentions this. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings or our tribulations or the trials. How can we rejoice in those? Look, tribulation and trials are coming. It rains on the just and the unjust. But we have hope through our trials. The sufferings of this present age aren't worthy to be compared to the glory you'll have in heaven. And so when we go through an attesting of our faith, that's why it says these tribulations, the Bible says count it all joy when you go through various trials because it produces faith. And that's what this does. It says rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance or perseverance. It, it produces a stronger person in faith. So because you've been through the hard times and because you've been through the trials and the suffering then, then you have endurance and you're building yourself up in faith so that other hard things will come, that we'll be able to get through it. We'll be able to endure because we have hope. And so it builds endurance. And we all need endurance in life. And believe me, it's getting worse and worse in life. It's getting harder. And the world's getting a scarier place. We need to have that endurance. Those that endure to the end shall be saved, the Bible says. You got to have faith. And it, it's, it's, it's not the one who runs the fastest race. It's the one who stays in the race and gets back up and doesn't give up and stays in the race, even though we go through trials, knowing that God will be with you and it'll build perseverance and endurance. But not only that, it produces character. Let me tell you something. God's not worried about our reputation with man. He's worried about our character. But let me tell you something. If you have character, they don't like your character, then they got a problem, not you. And, and character will show in your reputation as well. But God wants to change you on the inside, make you a good person. Not that you can just appear to be a good person or appear to be a Christian, but that you really are. You know, it, it produces character. God builds character in us when we go through trials and tribulations, but at the same time, we learn to endure and we have good character. And that gives us hope. <laughs> and then it says from character that produces hope. Because then you know, you know who you believe in, that God's able to come through. Wow. And then this next verse. Now hope does not disappoint. This is so good. <laughs> hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now <laughs> it's... Hope won't let you down because of the Holy Spirit he's given us as a gift. It's to your benefit I go away, Jesus said. If I go away, the Comforter or the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth will come. He will show you things to come and he will honor and glorify the Father and the Son. And he will guide you into all truth. He will help you through life. He's your friend. And so that is the seal we have until our redemption. He gives us the Holy Spirit. What a gift. What a down payment to know we have eternal life and to know our hope will not disappoint. Wow. Uh, First Thessalonians says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. Because we do have hope. <laughs> you don't have to sorrow when people pass away and know Jesus. And then Colossians 1.27, To them God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not just to the Gentiles, but to the, but to the Jew too. And so what he's saying here, he's saying that the hope is Christ in you. That is your hope of glory, having Christ in you and having your sins forgiven. I mean, we have hope and it won't disappoint. Praise the Lord. 
For when we were still without strength, wow, this is even getting better. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. In other words, Christ died for the ungodly in due time. He came at the right time and he came during that same time. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us. And they went, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Wow, what a powerful verse. God proved his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Praise the Lord that he died for us. It says you might find somebody. It says in due time, Christ died for the sinners and the ungodly. It says you might find a righteous man who will die uh, for another. But it says... Yet perhaps a good man would even dare to die. In other words, it's a rare thing to have someone willing to die for another. Maybe for a loved one. Maybe for someone they think is, is worth the price. But God died for those who, who are not, <laughs> who are ungodly. That makes him different. The good shepherd is the one who lays down his life for the sheep. But God proved his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is a powerful verse. It's, it's a verse in the Roman road, plan of salvation, as you explain salvation to people. Christ died for us much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Because we were, we were sealed <laughs> with a price and, and justified because his blood was shed for us for our forgiveness of sin. We've been justified by his blood, we shall be saved. Um, from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We're saved by his life and by the life that he lived, that he lived the perfect life and he was the bread of life and, and, and the life that he gave and given his life and rising from the dead, we're saved because of who he is. Praise the Lord. And we're justified because his blood was spilled for a price for our redemption. And not only that, even more, but we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation or peace with God. Praise the Lord. Now he's going to go into the effect of mankind through Adam, but mankind in general, and then Jesus when he came the God-man, the one who was fully God and fully man. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there was no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. Or they do different sins from Adam, but we've all sinned and fall short. So death reigns. The wages of sin is death. Who is the type of him who is to come? But the free gift is not uh, like the offense. For if one man's offense, many died, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. How much more will the fact that he paid for our debt <laughs> pay for, for salvation of many through Jesus Christ. So one death comes and sin, the other forgiveness and being justified and, and our payment made. And the gift that is not, and the gift is not like that which came through one who sinned, for the judgment who came through one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came to many offenses resulted in justification. The free gift, grace. For if by one man's offense death reigned through one, much more shall we receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as though one man's offense judgment came to men, resulting in condemnation, even through one man's righteous act of the free gift came to all men resulting in justification of life. For as one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, many were made righteous. <laughs> Praise God that Jesus came. 
Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise praise God. I told you grace was awesome. I mean, where sin abounded, sin abounds even more and more. But grace is more powerful. Grace abounds much more. <laughs> praise the Lord for grace. Amazing grace. Amazing love. God bless you. Have a blessed week. Dear Lord, thank you for grace. Thank you for faith. And thank you that you paid the debt for us so that we could be forgiven. We honor you and praise you and give glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen.